If you do not have an outline, please lift your hand, and these kind gentlemen will make sure that you have one. In the life of our church, we study the Bible rather in depth, and this morning is the second message of a beautiful book of the Bible, the book of Hosea. If you are clicking on our website, you can simply look at the button below this video, and you can click on the notes and download them and uh, print them out so that you can follow along that much more carefully. I just have a question for you. Have you ever come in to maybe a, a room in the house um, where a family member is watching a movie and they're all into it and you're coming in midstream and you have no idea what's going on? You maybe sit down and you try to start piecing it together, but the whole story is just not making very much sense, right? Right? Have you ever experienced that before? And the more complicated the story, the more difficult that is, right? Now, if it's Hallmark, it's pretty easy. But um, if it, I'm, I'm sorry, babe. Um, some of y'all are getting mad at me about the Hallmark comments. But, you know, uh, we, we often need orientation on the story. And if you do come in midstream, you really need someone to help you get caught up a little bit. But even better is the other people on the couch to say, well, why don't we just restart it for you? Um, right? Has that ever happened? Has anybody watch through something you've already seen because you came in late? Well, this morning we want to be careful to get as much orientation we can on a powerful story. And what happens when we do that is, is that we understand the story so much more and we see the meaning in the message so much clearer if we're careful to understand the background of it and if we're careful to look at what is, is before us in the words. And so notice the screen in front of you, Hosea, and I, and I want you to see this, this image that Robin beautifully made uh, using some artwork that uh, she put together. But you see here the story from last week that Hosea is commanded by God to go and marry a woman who is, is not faithful, a woman who keeps running away, a woman who keeps going out after others. And he's called to even go and get her again, as we see in chapters 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3. And the great reason behind this is the tagline for this, this series is that it's God's scandalous love for his unfaithful people. While his unfaithful people keep seeking to pull away, God is holding tight. And God is calling his people back to himself time and time again. A glorious book and message of the Bible that my wayward heart needs to hear. And that I pray that your heart that is prone to wander and prone to run away needs to hear. Well, in the, in the process of us doing this and understanding the deeper background, you see on your outline there this idea of deeper background and the setting of Hosea and really even the, the person of who Hosea is. Over the last seven years, we've studied some people in the Bible. We have studied the Gospel of John. We spent, in fact, three years in the Gospel of John. John being one of the youngest, or the youngest disciple, being the beloved of Jesus, walking with Jesus in, as part of the inner core of the disciples. John had unique perspective, and then we spend time, we spent time studying what he told us in the Gospel of John. And as we got to know John, as we got to know his perspective, and as we heard the truths that the Holy Spirit gave him to give to us, we got to see the glorious picture of who Jesus really is. If you're wondering who Jesus really is, the Gospel of John is a great, great book that just explodes in vivid detail who Jesus really is. We, we not only study who Jesus really is, but we study how he saves us. In the Gospel of John, the, the, both the Christology of that and the soteriology of that or the salvational truth of that was glorious for us and helpful for us for three years. And then we ran to the book of Jude, 
the Lord led us to study this little 25 verses at the back of the New Testament that was so powerful to us. And we got to see that Jude was a faithful teacher of the gospel in a time when many people were not faithful. And then there was the half-brother of Jesus, James. We spent over a year studying the book of James as we looked at the, the beautiful picture of this being, listen to this, the very first letter sent out to the early church came from the Jerusalem church through the Lord's half-brother. He was a son of Mary, um, but of course not a son of the Holy Spirit like Jesus was, so he was a half-brother of Jesus. But James being an early church leader, and we see all the issues he was covering in the early church. But as we got to know James, the whole message of James made more sense. And then we studied Titus. Titus, who was sent by Paul to Crete, and Titus, who was really the Apostle Paul's hatchet man. I mean, he was the guy that was sent in for the tough jobs. In fact, he went to Crete in order to clear out the bad leaders and, and bring in new leaders for the churches that were on the island of Crete. And we saw how vivid that picture was for our own lives today, here in America and around the world in 2019 the picture and the story of Titus. So these four, as we've gotten to know these four, this has been helpful to us to understand the Bible, helpful for us to understand the gospel, helpful for us to understand the picture of the New Testament and all that is there that God has for us. Well, this morning, we, we are going back to one of these early messages in Hosea where we want to get to know Hosea a little bit. We want to get to know who he is. We want to get to know what his job was and what his family was because his family plays a big part in this story, in, in God's message through him. And so as we study Hosea, we want to see who he is and what he does. So notice on your outline, I've, I've called it here, the deeper background, that's at the top of the page there, the deeper background and setting of Hosea. As we dive in and sink our teeth into the biblical backgrounds of this, it will make the message of Hosea so much clearer. And so, so what exactly is a prophet? I just want to take a very quick message, uh, a very qu quick moment here and look at this. First of all, there are God's prophets and there are pagan prophets. So there are prophets in many different religions and there were prophets in the Old Testament that were gods and there were pagan prophets. You remember with me, and you may put this out to the side, the prophets of Baal. We've already talked about Baal or Baal. Uh, worship was a very um, intense uh, other religion and false god that was around the people of God. Look at number two, the uses of the term prophet. First of all, sometimes it's used as a visionary leader um, we see that a little bit in a few of the names that we're going to list between Genesis and, and Psalms, but it's, that's not typically what a prophet is really known of, especially as we look at the prophets of God. Certainly the next one here, some prophets are seen as a seer or someone who is a fortune teller, and we don't see that at all as being the prophets of God. There were some of them that had the ability to see into the future or the ability to know something um, that they had not seen with their own eyes through God's omniscient wisdom working through them and his knowledge in them. But we see that they were certainly not the kind of prophets, and fill this in, that were a prophet for profit. Do you see that? That they would make money with telling the fortune. They would make money with answering questions. That is not at all the people of God that were prophets. Instead, the third one there is really the one that we see Hosea as and the other prophets. They are a proclaimer. They proclaim a message, a message from God. And so you can put a big circle around that one. That is really what Hosea was. He was truly the proclaimer. Even though there are events that he tells of that are in the future that are going to come, he's not doing that for gain, and he's not simply being a visionary leader. He is primarily a message proclaimer of God. Look at number three. Amidst God's people, there were true prophets and false prophets. So even within the nation of Israel, that he may not, they may not have been a prophet of Baal or some other god. They would have claimed to be a prophet of God, but they were not a true prophet of God. 
they were false prophets. And here's how you know the difference. True prophets always pointed people to worship God alone. False prophets would often mix in other gods. And so, one of the key distinctives when you read Old Testament truth, when you read the prophets of the Old Testament, one thing that you will see very clearly is that they always declare God as the only one to be worshipped and the only one to be obeyed and the only one to be feared and the only one to be loved. And so here we see true prophets always pointed to the worship of God alone. All the prophets highlighted in Scripture were true prophets. So the ones that were highlighted. Now there's others that are mentioned, but their folly is declared. They, they are shown as false prophets and by, their, by the word and by the message and by their actions. Notice number four. True or good prophets prophesied about, here's what they prophesied about, either current issues and usually keeping or breaking the covenant with God. So they would, they would call the nation out for breaking its covenant with God. So that would be current issues. Much of them are on that. But occasionally they would also deal with future events. Sometimes this was to validate their message, but other times it was to bring hope. And so the future events, what future events do prophets talk about? They talk about a coming Messiah. That is very important for us. If there's no Messiah, there's no salvation. And so the coming Messiah, how about this one? The coming judgment, that there is a great judgment, and all of the prophets talk about the day of the Lord and the judgment. And not only that, but the renewal, and notice this, the restoration. We see this lined through each prophet of the Old Testament. We see a message of hope in the midst of the condemnation and the judgment for their sin. God in his love and in his grace, still presents his goodness in his grace that he brings renewal and restoration. Can you say amen? amen? I mean, there are so many times that I have read in the Old Testament, in the Old Prophets, and in, in, the, in the thick judgment of God upon our sin, and I'm just thinking, wow, is there any hope? Is there any hope at all? And then the thread shows up of God's grace and of his mercy that we must have because the judgment shows us that without it we are doomed. Look at number five. The prophets were not teachers of God's word and the law. They were not teachers of that. That was the job of the priests. You see, the priests do that. So fill in both of those. That Their intent was not to daily, weekly, monthly spend time with the people, teaching them the law, teaching them the covenant of God, teaching them um, the love of God and the joy of God and the judgment of God. That, that wasn't their day in and day out task was to, to be the discipler among God's people. No, the prophets were called to declare important messages that the nation needed to hear. There would have been many, many priests and few prophets. Look at number six. The prophets had particular messages. We've kind of touched on this a little bit, but I want you to see it clearly. The particular messages were important. Usually they were warning, or they were judgment, or they were also calls to repentance, and I, I'm so grateful they were declaring a salvation that was only found in God. And so it wasn't only about the being cut off from God because of their sin, it was also about the beautiful picture of salvation in God. Now, many of you have seen the Bible Project videos. Um, you have become aware of this ministry, and I want you to see, that. just go ahead and go to the blue screen there. If you don't know about the Bible Project, I want to encourage you to go online and begin cruising around on their website. Um, this will help you in your study of the Bible. So often, you're sitting there reading in the Scripture, and you're going, what does that even mean? I don't understand. If you're new to the Bible, that can be the case. Or some of you have been walking with the Lord for 40 or 50 years, and you still sometimes are really perplexed. If you will go and get those, get those help, this is like cliff notes for the Bible. Did any of you use cliff notes when you were in high school? 
Oh my goodness, some of you don't even know what they are. Too bad for you, you missed out. That's all I gotta say. I was a cliff note dude. So I, 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 I man, I, I need the, the, the quick picture, you know, uh, of the whole thing. So the Bible project can help you have an orientation on the whole story so that as you read it, you will, you will be helped. Well, they have a video called The Prophets. And it's only five minutes long, and I want us to see it right now. I believe that this will encourage you and help you as you study and as we study together the prophets of God, and particularly Hosea. So the message of the prophets, which would, they played a particular role in God's people, that, he would, that they would be calling God's people to listen to what he had said. And the, granted, the, there, were, there were many different ways in which they got the people's attention. I, I want to encourage you to go back and watch that video, as well as other videos like that, a few times. That's where it, you know, you look at it once, you can go, huh. And then you start reading, or you watch it a few more times, and you, you start to see where they're going, and part of it makes more and more sense. But the picture is, is that God had a purpose for the prophets, and he would use the prophets in order to get his message across to the people. Let's look in the middle page of side one on your outline. There are popular Old Testament prophets that we should learn about. These were the ones that were recorded in Scripture and that we have their prophecies. And from Genesis, many of you commented this last week about the timeline on last week's outline. Did that really help you understand from Adam all the way to Jesus where the, the uh, storyline goes and where the narrative goes? This is similar to that. Now we're going and we're zooming in on this time period where we see the prophets most active. But the prophets were early. I mean, there were some of them that from Genesis um, through Psalms, and this is from 2000 BC to 800 BC, and Abraham being one of the first great prophets of God. And then, of course, Moses. Moses was a prophet. He was also a visionary leader. He was also one whom God would use to, to do many things in the nation of Israel. Samuel was a prophet. It would be Samuel who would anoint the king. Samuel that would proclaim the day of the Lord. There, then there was Nathan. Do you remember who Nathan was as a prophet? When David had sinned with Bathsheba, it was one of the prophets that God said, Nathan, you're going to go confront King David. King David thinks he's gotten away with something. And Nathan you're going to declare to him this. And so Nathan goes before the king, tells a parable about a family with a small uh, lamb that was like a pet, and a rich man comes, takes their lamb, and eats it for dinner when there are guests around. And David is enraged that this has happened in the kingdom. And then it was Nathan the prophet who looked at King David and said, you are the man who has done this as you took Uriah's wife, when you have so much in all that is before you, and you looked at something that you didn't have, and you took it, and you schemed for it, and then you sought to cover it up. You see, so the, the prophets played a very important role in us seeing God deal with his people and calling his people back to himself in showing us his grand plan and his grand love. Then there was also Elijah, and who would come after Elijah, but also we see Elisha. And so these prophets were part of that period of time before we come to what is called the divided kingdom. But the minor, the major and the minor prophets primarily we see are operating between around 760 B.C. This is the 8th century, but 760 B.C. to around 400 B.C. We see this during the divided kingdom. This is when the nation of Israel separates from the nation of Judah. So it's all nation of Israel when it comes to God's people. But we see that there is a separation. In fact, on the screen, I think you can kind of see a little bit of this map. It's kind of hard to tell because of the colors. But Israel is at the top and Judah is at the bottom. There's another one. Go ahead and show the next one there. Yes. So the blue is the kingdom to the north. That's called Israel. And the yellow is the kingdom to the south, which is called Judah. Jerusalem would be in Judah. 
And so these kingdoms are separated. This was not God's design. This was not God's original intention and plan for them um, in the sense that he had designed for them to live in the, in the promised land and to obey his call and his, and his keeping and to keep his covenant, and yet they rebelled. They said, we don't want you to be our king. We want a king like all the other nations have kings. They bring in Saul, David, Solomon, and then a divided kingdom um, there is a great conflict. They're warring. They're angry. They, there's all kinds of difficulty that comes upon God's people because of this divided kingdom. And it's during that divided kingdom that there are different times when either Israel or Judah is straying away from God. In fact, Israel, they never had any good kings. The, the, the kingdom to the north. Uh, Judah had some good kings, but there was this picture of great division and great hardship and not following after God. And that's where all of the prophets of the Old Testament fit in. And so, as you look at this, I want you to see what I've kind of outlined here to help it make sense a little bit. As we move down through the centuries, getting closer to Jesus, remember this is B.C., so 700s, 600s, 500s, 400s, as we go through these centuries, we see God continuing to work and continuing to move with his people. We're not going to read all of this, but I want to encourage you to read this, but there are some themes I want you to see. First of all, would you put a nice dark square around the first two words under the 700s where it says Assyrian Empire? Put a good big square around that, nice dark square, because the Assyrian Empire was, in fact, one of the great enemies of God's people, and they would come, and they would attack, and they would inhabitate, and they would even carry off God's people. Go down to the 600s, and you see in the middle of that first line, it says, Assyria continues, but eventually declines as Babylon, or put a big square around the word Babylon. So here is another empire. You cannot read the prophets and really expect to understand what's going on if you don't understand that Assyria during one section of time is the nemesis of the nation, and Babylon rises up, and then yet in the 500s, another kingdom rises up. And it goes from Babylon to the last word in that line is Persia. Put a big square around Persia. And so as you read through the prophets and as you read through the history books of the Old Testament, you will start to see that these pagan empires are even used by God to work in the hearts of his own people. God uses these pagan empires to correct his people, to punish his people, to show them their need for him. And so he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That is of the good kings and that is of the bad kings. That is of the good lords and that is of the bad lords. He reigns supreme over all of them. So look back over there in the 700s. The very first prophet that we mention is Hosea. Put a big circle around that. And so it's appropriate that as we launch into Hosea, as we look at Hosea, we see his message and we see how he's being use early on in the divided kingdom, and the message that he gives is a message that we even need today. But notice that Hosea and Amos preach against, what does it say? Social injustices and covenantal disobedience. And they proclaim the day of judgment is coming. Now, some of those judgments would be through these pagan kingdoms. And so they would be warned, and they would be, it would be declared that this is going to happen, this place is going to fall, or that place is going to fall, so-and-so is going to come and wipe out a certain area. These were prophecies that would bring validity, validity to these prophets' messages. So notice here, look at the one underneath that, Jonah. Do you remember the story of Jonah? Jonah reluctantly preaches to Nineveh. Now, Jonah was told, go to Nineveh and preach to them that they better repent. And Jonah said, well, actually, Jonah didn't do anything. He didn't say anything to the Lord. All he did was run the other direction. He got on a boat and headed for Spain. And the Lord causes a storm. Jonah winds up in the belly of a fish. He comes to Jesus in that moment, and the fish drops him off over there headed back toward Nineveh. 
And so here's this beautiful picture of God working in glorious ways in order to show his might and his power over the wretched human condition. And then again, of course, Jonah goes and obeys the Lord in that. Isaiah is one of the greatest prophets of his era. And he preaches the rich promise of a savior in his kingdom. We have just finished Christmas season just a couple of months ago, a month and a half ago. And we would often read much of the story of Isaiah and also Micah proclaiming that a Messiah is going to come. In fact, you see Micah there. It overlaps with Israel. Micah rebukes Israel for societal sins and tells of God's victory over Sennacherib. But it's also in Micah that we see that Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem. And so that is, that is the, it's not listed here, but that's one of the things that Micah shows us. In fact, that the Messiah, the great one who would come and redeem, does that. So through the 600s, the 500s, the 400s, you see Zephaniah, Nahum, Habakkuk, uh, Jeremiah, all the way through, working through them and through the various crises that the nation of Israel would incur because of their rebellion against God. Now look down at the 400s at the very bottom. Malachi, Ezra, Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah is interesting that they are still prophets, and they are prophets of this era, but they also mention the era before the divided kingdom. And, and that's just, for those of you who've been studying the Bible for a while, it's interesting that their prophecies would, would be associated with First and Second Chronicles in a very intimate way. But notice that Joel, Joel calls the people to repentance amidst a terrible plague of locusts. Um, so there would, be, there would be various plagues, various judgments that God would bring, either from pagan nations or from natural issues, all because God is bringing his people to himself in the midst. Of, he could walk away from them and reject them forever, but that's not what we see God does because of the covenant that he has made. Now, we see that ever so clearly as we flip the page that in Pastor Ben has already read the text. We see this picture that there is a model and a message. There's a model and a message. Fill that in at the top. The life of Hosea and his family is a model. And it's a model to us all the way through the prophecy. So, understanding chapter 1 is important for understanding the rest of the book. I want you to very quickly see. In verses 2 through 3, that's where Hosea is told to go marry a woman who's going to be unfaithful to him. Hosea's own family would vividly expose Israel's great unfaithfulness and injury to the Lord. Fill these in. Gomer wanders and Hosea pursues. And that represents... Israel idolizes, it goes after other idols and other gods, but God corrects and redeems. And what about us? We are unfaithful, circle the word yet, yet he is faithful. While we are still sinners, Christ dies for us. This is the picture. So this message is incredibly important, and it's shown out in his own marriage. But not only his marriage, but we also see it's showing out. The message is being proclaimed in his children and what God tells him to name his children. Look at verse 4. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. This is his first child. And by the way, up in verse 3, underline where it says, and she conceived, and then underline, and bore him a son. So this is clearly Hosea's son, bore him a son. Um, and look at verse 4. He is told to name him Jezreel. He says, I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel of the valley of Jezreel. You say, that's not talking about the Assyrians. Why is God coming against Israel? Listen, God deals much more harshly <laughs> with his own children in order to correct them very often than he does with the world. The world, as, as Pastor Ben was talking about this last week in men's boot camp, that the Lord, the Lord will give us over 
to the sins of our flesh. We, we are given over into that. And four, the nations that are rebelling against God, that don't know God, who are not God's people, that is indeed is the case. But when we see God bringing judgment on his own people, the purpose of this is to rebuke them and to bring them back to himself. Notice this in verses 4 through 5, fill it in. In his mercy, God uses radical signs and symbols to communicate his message. And one of those radical signs and symbols is the names of the children that he has given. Fill this in or just kind of read along underneath that where it says 4 and 5. Hosea's firstborn is named after an incident where a godly man, Naboth of where? Of Jezreel. So this is the Jezreel Valley. There's a hill and a valley that is there. This is, this is the, uh, a godly man who lives there was murdered by King Ahab and Jezebel. You ever heard Jezebel? Some of you say, oh, she's a Jezebel. That woman is mean. Well, you go read this story and you'll understand why people say that. A wicked king and a wicked king's wife. And so here we see that because of that sin, and Ahab, listen to this, Ahab had brought and nationalized pagan worship in the nation of Israel. So here is an Israel king who is nationalizing, bringing into full acceptance and promotion the worship of other gods. Let me tell you that the one true God of Israel doesn't take kindly to that. And so we see that great judgment is coming on Baal worship and all manner of societal wickedness was going to be judged. I wish we had time to read that story. You really need to read those two passages from Kings um, this afternoon in order for you to fully understand that. And it's, it's, it's just truly fascinating to see how God is rebuking Israel through Hosea for exceedingly wicked kings and the people's action. But in verses 6 through 7, look what it says here on the right-hand side. There is a certain terrifying judgment that comes upon those who are not God's children. And we see that in verse 6. Look what it says. So she conceived again and bore a daughter. Notice it does not say bore him a daughter. It's very clear that she, if, she, if the daughter had been Hosea's child, it would have said, bore him a daughter, but it just simply says, she conceived and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name no mercy. And we're going to see why we say that in just a minute, but call, call her name no mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. Wow. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah. Remember we said that at different times, Judah is more faithful than Israel. Here's one of those times. But, and here we see, I will save them by the Lord their God. And I will save them, talking about Judah, not Israel. I will save them by bow, excuse me. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. You say, what is the big deal? Put out there to the side, miraculous. Because he is going to miraculously save them and he is going to fully condemn Israel. Now notice this. Why would he do this? In verse 6 and 7, there's a certain terrifying judgment that comes upon those who are not God's children. So the focus of the naming of Jezreel is to say that, hey, an injustice was occurred and all of these wrong worship was there and that God is condemning that and this guy's children, Hosea's children, are going to be a testimony of that. And then no mercy comes along as she is named no mercy. This is a, why would you name your kid Hosea? Hosea, why would you name your daughter no mercy? Well, the Lord told me to because there is a lesson for all of us in this. You see, that's the idea, that we have been unfaithful to God. Israel has been unfaithful to God, and there's not going to be mercy. There is not going, we're going to be cut off. So notice this, he bore a daughter. This is not Hosea's child. That's the point. Israel's apostate. Judah is faithful at this moment. Israel is condemned, but Judah is miraculously saved. And so there is, we're seeing this great and glorious God who will not be sharing himself and sharing his worship with other gods. He will judge that. And then in the last part of it, the third child that we see that, that Hosea has is one who is named not my people. 
And this is so intense, but yet so just the poetic justice of all of this is amazing. Look at verse 8 through 11. When she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. So first one was a son, second one's a daughter, now is a son, and again, not Hosea's son. Verse 9, and the Lord said, call his name not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Friends, you don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Holy One of the universe, say, you are not mine. Notice verses 8 through 11, or 10 uh, through 11. Look what it says. Yet the number of children of Israel shall be like the the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. In the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. You say, well, what changed? Look at this in verse 11. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel, so these divided kingdoms, shall be gathered together. And they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land For great shall be the day of Jezreel. This picture back to God's faithfulness in his justice. I want you to see verses 8 and 11 on the right-hand side. God's covenant with his people will will only be fulfilled by his own mercy and grace. There is no reason that he should have mercy on them. Again, this is not Hosea's child. Not my people is not his child. So Israel has, here's the point. Second bullet point there. Israel has lost all claim to God's covenant. They have nothing to stand on. They have been told they are not his people because of their rebellion and because of their rejection. But there is that key word, yet, at the beginning of verse 10. Can you circle that word over there in the beginning of verse 10? Circle it big because that idea is not only here, but it persists through the New Testament and into our salvation. Because if our God does not say yet or but, however, we are lost. Notice what it says here. Yet, God's covenant with Abraham is renewed, even with the language of Genesis 22 and 32, where it talks about the stars of the heavens or the sands of the sea. Look what it says in verse 10. Yet the number of of the children of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. You see, friends, listen, that is God's mercy on people who deserve to be condemned. The point is, they clearly have rebelled against God. They clearly have run away against God. They have gone out after other gods, and they have acted horribly and wickedly in the midst of the nation. They have done everything that the other nations have done around them. They have said, you are not our God. And God says to them, you're right. But I will keep my covenant that I made with you. Now, I believe that this happens to show us that salvation is only from God. We will never keep the covenant. We will never keep our end of the bargain. We will always blow it. And so the grand and glorious message of the entire Bible is that you cannot be holy enough for God. You'll never do it. And so God comes and he says, if you just come to me, I will make you holy. I will clean you. I will empower you. I will come and live within you. I'll do what you will never be able to do. And this is what it means to have come to have faith in Jesus. And so it's through faith in the Messiah that God would provide, that the prophets are saying, a Messiah is going to come, a Messiah is going to come. Come to the covenant of God. Stay with the covenant of God. Yes, you messed up, but come back to the covenant of God. A Messiah is going to come, and he's going to pay for the sins of the world, the sins of the past and the sins of the present and the sins of the future. And if you will place your faith in what God provides instead of yourself, you will see that there is no other God that you need 
and you will see that you can do nothing to add to what he has done himself for your salvation. Now, friends, I know this is thick. I know that this passage is a little bit difficult. I know that this book is, is in that way. But listen, if you'll just begin to think about what we're studying, if you'll begin to sink your teeth into the fact that God is bringing about his people to come back to him, and through the judgment, we see his holiness. Through the statements of judgment, we see, you see he's showing us that we're out of bounds. You see, our, our sinful hearts tend to think way too highly of ourselves. We tend to think, well, I'm not that bad. I mean, I'm an American, and that's better than being some other group or something like that. Sometimes we can think nationalistically, or sometimes we can think Baptistly. Well, I'm a Baptist. What do you mean? That's got to be better than the, you know, the Presbyterian, the, you know, whatever. I mean, I, I don't know what things we make up in our minds. I'm, you know, we, we have a sense of self-righteousness that will take us to hell. When we do not recognize that we are woefully inadequate, that we are woefully falling short, sin means to miss the mark. We miss the mark of the glory of God. We fall short, and God's condemnation is coming unless there is complete and total forgiveness. And complete and total forgiveness does not come from you making up for your shortcomings. It comes from Christ God's sacrifice for our sins. And so notice this, if you haven't already filled it in, most intimate restoration of relationship with not only God, but other people. And we see that in verse 11, that not only in verse 10 at the end, it says that we've been made right with God, children of the living God. But look at verse 11, in the children of who? Of Judah, that's the southern kingdom, and the children of Israel, will be gathered together. You see, when we get saved, not only were we made right with God, but we can be made right with people around us. Amen. This is where the relational beauty of God's salvation comes. Look at Romans 5, verses 8 through 9 as we close. I want you to see this, and I want you to put a big box around the first two words of that. But God. There are numerous places in the New Testament where we see the phrase, but God. And usually the picture is this, that we are in our sin, but God comes. Ephesians chapter 2 does the same thing. Look at Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Look at verse 9. Since, therefore, we now have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from what? The wrath of God. The wrath of God. You see, this is glorious good news. The wrath is coming without forgiveness. But in forgiveness, the wrath is satisfied in Christ and pardon is issued. And not just pardon, but listen to this, reunification with God is given. And the glorious promises of God for life eternal with Him. As Pastor Ben prayed, no more sin, no more death, no more sickness, no more sorrow. That these, it almost sounds too good to be true, but praise God that it's not, because the king of the universe who created all things says it's true. And so we see that this God has a grand plan. It's a beautiful plan. He's going to work from Adam to Christ to bring us into conformity with him. And then from Christ until the final marriage supper of the Lamb, God has a plan. And here we are in this era that we can see that Christ indeed is our only hope. Hosea is, is making the case to the nation of Israel, turn to God, turn to God, turn to God. To God. Look at the bottom page, the bottom of the page here. Here I want you to see this as we close. God's message through Hosea and his family. So it's a Gomer and we, you see these three kids, Jezreel, no mercy, and not my people. God's message through Hosea and his family is poetically shouting. Have you ever heard poetry shouted before? Probably not. 
But the impact of it, the impact of it is loud. He is poetically shouting, and here's what he's shouting. People, you've blowed it. You've forsaken me in every way. But I am going to save you without any help from you or anyone else. I am the Ancient of Days who reigns on high and establishes your salvation after the counsel of my will and grace. I only require, and here it is, that you turn and trust in me alone. That's what he wants. That's what God wants with you. He wants you to turn and to trust in him alone. We just finished starting point this morning where we talked about religion versus relationship. People that have religion are trusting in themselves. People that have a relationship with Christ have simply turned to Christ and said, Lord, you are the only hope. And if you have given me so great a gift of salvation, may I live in gratitude. Friend, if you've never given your heart to Christ, return to him in this picture of receiving him as the Lord. It's really the best way to say it, to receive him. John chapter 1 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who have believed in him as the Savior of the world. This is what it means to come to God on his terms. Let's pray. Would you stand together with me for prayer?